Well, thank you very much for being here and welcome uh, to tonight to this event and um, on public monuments, contemporary art and social protest in Chile, uh, the book that it's been just launched or we're launching now. Uh, this is for me a very exciting uh, moment uh, that is connected to what is happening in the world now and in very in particular uh, with what is happening in Chile, but also it's a uh, important moment to reflect on monuments and what it imply, what they imply and how they are sites of, of uh, political um, uh, dispute, uh, solidarity, alternative experimentation uh, and how important that is. My name is Andres Jaque and I'm the Dean of, the, of, the, of Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture uh, planning uh, and preservation. Uh, I will be moderating tonight's event, standing uh, in for Professor Jorge Teropailos, who will be joining us uh, remotely uh, due to COVID. And it's very sad, but I'm so excited that we can use technology to, to make sure that, that Jorge is here with, with us tonight. It is an honor to welcome you uh, and our distinguished panelists to Columbia University. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Historic Preservation Program at Columbia GSAP, uh, directed by Jorge Otero Pailos, uh, the Institute of Latin American Studies, and the Columbia Global Center in Santiago de Chile. We are here to celebrate the US release of the book Sobre Monumentos, the book that I have here with me, and that probably many of you have seen already. Uh, with five of the book's contributors, which I will introduce shortly, who are all here in the first row. We are here to, uh, the, the book captures a collective effort to rethink the social role of historic monuments to contemporary art in the context of the so-called social explosion. Starting in October, 2019, the social explosion was a spontaneous response to the Chilean government's decision to raise the cost of public transportation it was initially led by university students. It then grew uh, to become an all encompassing movement for social justice and equity that cut across social economic lines, federating indigenous groups, feminists, LGBTQ plus groups, climate activists, senior citizens, and many other sectors of the population. A violent police repression ensued that left many bounded Street fronts were destroyed, historic buildings burned, and monuments toppled. One of tonight's panelists, Emilio, Emilio de la Cerda, was serving as the subsecretary for cultural heritage for Chile's Ministry of Culture, Arts, Arts and Heritage. De la Cerda is an architect and partner of OWAR Architects. Uh, I actually met him as the dean of the, of the School of Architecture de Católica, the director of the School of Architecture de Católica. Uh, he's, uh, he served as Secretary of the Council of Nation, National Monuments of Chile from 2011 to 2014. And as I said, Dean of the School of Architecture at the Pontificia University Católica, where he continues uh, serving as professor. It fell on his shoulders to develop policies for how to approach the delicate subject of protecting heritage in the midst of the social explosion. He saw the need to entirely rethink how Chile approached heritage. He convened a group of national and international experts at the intersection of contemporary art and preservation, including the other panelists here tonight, to imagine new futures for Chile's monuments, more in line with the forward thinking movement of experimental preservation. In January, 2020, in the midst of the social explosion, he invited Professor Jorge Otero Pailos to Santiago to participate in, in this rethinking. Professor Otelo Pailos uh, is an artist, architect and preservationist known for his practical and theoretical contributions uh, to experimental preservation. He directs the historic preservation program at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation. His artworks have been exhibited at international biennials, including Venice, and are in the collections of major museums internationally. Otero Pailos is the recipient of the 2021-22 American Academy in Rome's Roy Lichtenstein's residency in the visual arts. He edited volume 
historic uh, preservation theory and anthropology readings from the 18th century to the 21st century that was published in October of this year. He serves on New York City's Public Design Commission's Conservation Advisory Group. Emilio also convened Luis Montes, who is also here with us tonight, a sculptor and restorer who was charged with the difficult task of restoring the statue of General Baquedano. The statue stood in the center of Santiago's Plaza Dignidad, which was the epicenter of the demonstrations during the social explosion. Montes is academic director of the Faculty of the Arts and professor of visual arts at the University of Chile. Among his many exhibitions, it is worth highlighting his solo show at the Museum Nacional de Bellas Artes, 2019 and 2020, which coincides with the social explosion. The group of experts also included Michel Bogart, who's also here with us, uh, who is Professor Emerita of Art History and Stony Brook University at Stony Brook University. Her research focuses on public art in New York City, and she's the author of many articles and books on the subject, including The Politics of Urban Beauty, New York and its Art Commissions, uh, 2006, and a Sculpture in Gotham, Art and Urban Renewal in New York. From 1999 to 2003, she was by president of New York's Public Design Commission. She currently serves uh, on the Commission's of Conservation Advisory Group, which oversees the care of the city's monument. And lastly, Emilio also convened Cecilia Vicuña, an amazing, amazing artist that we all know and admire, and poet known as one of the founders of conceptual art in Chile and many, many other uh, things. Uh, her concept of the poetics of precarity proposes a relational space between subjects and objects to performances and actions. This year alone, she was awarded the Golden Lion at the 59th International Exhibition at the Venice Biennale, at the Solo Zone at the Guggenheim Museum in New York that I'm sure many of you have seen, uh, and received the commission of the Tate Modern Turbine Hall, which is uh, one of probably the most exciting things that have happened to art in the, in the last decade. The work is in the collection of Tate, MoMA, Santiago's Museum, Museo Nacional de Bellas Artes, and many, many others. And I'm very honored to have worked with Tilia and an amazing ex, uh, installation of a kipu in San, the Shanghai Biennial and a sound piece that we did together for those. She, she, she was very, very generous to, to do with uh, a project that is called Wet Togetherness. That was so, so impressive. And I, uh, I encourage everyone to, to find it. Uh, the speakers will make brief opening statements. Then we will turn to the panel discussion, we will start with, let me make sure. We will start with Emilio, Emilio de Cerda, that was, will be followed by Michel Bogart. Uh, then uh, we will have um, Luis Montes intervening, uh, and then uh, Cecilia Vicuña, uh, and then Jorge Otero will intervene remotely. And then we will uh, all be here and I will be honor to moderate a, a discussion and a Q and A with all of you. So uh, please, Emilio, you want to start? Well, thank you very much, Andres. Thank you everybody for, for being here today. Um, it's a great honor to be here with all the author you mentioned. Um, I want to send a special um, kind of thanks to Jorge that it's with COVID today and he's not with us and he's the organizer of all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, to the Historic Preservation Program, to the Institute of Latin American Studies and also the Colombia Global Center for making this possible and to Sarah Grace, of course, for the organization and support. Thanks also to Cecilia, uh, Michelle and Luis for being part of the book about monuments primarily launched during last summer in Chile and for all uh, your presence today in the panel. As we have seen in many contexts around the world during the last decade, 
2019 was also in Chile a period of intense social protests, the greatest since the recovery of democracy more than 30 years ago. And after five governments of political and institutional stability, economic growth, poverty alleviation, access to higher education, among other improvements uh, in the standards of living of the population, this was at least what raised indicators and reports shows when we analyzed this period of our recent history. I don't know. Um, here. To change the, this one. Ah, okay, here. During these years, and according to this process, the idea of a massive social outburst that shows an underground dissatisfaction incubated over time was something unthinkable. That state of situation changed drastically after October of 19, um, 19, 20, 2019, thanks. The massive protests and the violent destruction of public goods that was one of the phases of these events was at the same time a paradox and an urgent call to stop the march. We needed to understand this emergence, trying to distinguish between the different kind of forces and motivations that were acting on the public space. At the same time, as a society, we started to discuss the ways to find a renovated social agreement capable to include all these forms of material, political, and intangible disagreements and demands. One of the particularities of Chilean protests was that they stressed and challenged the symbols represented on public monuments on the main cities and emblematic places of the country as remnants of structures of domination of the past and all the expired order that new times were called to overcome. Baquedano Square in Santiago and the equestrian monument that gives its name to this emblematic place of the city was the seismic epicenter of the whole movement. This was beyond the scope of the image of the singular local hero of the Pacific War of the end of the 19th century, whose sculpture was installed in the place in 1928, becoming since then a landmark of the whole country. During days, weeks, and months, we saw how founding fathers, colonial features, industrial personalities, and in some way, every symbol that smells to power was intervened, beaten, painted, vandalized, replaced, and eventually retired from public space. New values and identities were pushing to their recognition in a massive wave of color, music, performance, but also confrontation and appropriation of the common goods of the city. Because this situation, Chilean protests, had this contradictory mixture of hope and rage, of celebration and destruction. Maybe because of this ambiguity, especially at the beginning, violence was, was not condemned as um, an, an, an acceptable political tool in democracy. The so-called social outbreak cracked the state of situation, criticizing the last decades and demanding urgent changes in living condition. This was the origin of the dramatic political agreement accorded by the Chilean parliament on October 25 to start the process to peace um, and a new constitution trying to find a political way to change the generalized crisis. In this context, as the public authority of cultural heritage of the country and working hand by hand with a great number of professionals, NGOs, ministries, institutions, public services, among others, we try to protect cultural assets and historic patrimony from destruction and at the same time to reflect and understand the scope, motivations, and perspectives of what was happening. The retirement of General Baquedano amplified in real time by all the mass media and the process of restoration taken by the Atelier of Luis Montes reflected this in a condensed way. We were forced to act drastically and fast after one year and a half of interventions, not as a way to hide protest, but as a way to protect people's integrity and the permanence of the monument itself. Perhaps 
we were monitoring the stability of the monument after every event. During a manifestation in March 2021, two of the bronze legs of the horse were almost sliced, putting in life risk, risk a lot of people that were in the place and threatening the art and historical piece itself. The cinematographic and complex retirement of Baquedano with the empty plinth that stayed in the square was interpreted as one of the main symbols of social outbreak. Some people consider it reflects the, defe the defeat of the rule of law and history. Other groups appreciate the protection of the attacked monument. Some consider it a good news because this could be the first step for a new urban design of the whole area. Others associated it as the major movement of iconoclasm in Chilean recent history, and others celebrated as a political triumph. As an open symbol, many of these lectures were possible and also complementary. In parallel to the work of protecting the an historic and emblematic monument whose imminent fall could endure or kill sever, several protesters, we started a rigorous work of restoration of which Luis will tell more details. Considering that through the single monument literally passed the energy of the protest, we decided to use the experimental preservation approach proposed by Jorge Otero Pailos and others to rescue the palimpsest of paintings and elements that covered the piece, becoming an unexpected complex archive and one of the most symbolic material remnants of this historic period. In this artificial and synthetic scheme, we reflected the rage, the joy, the demands, the shame, the attempt to normalize, the will of order, the fire, the dust, the tear gas, the colors as the rainbow, the green, the white, the red, and the black, oil paint that tries to clumsily imitate the pattern of the bronze as a way to restore the dignity of the monument. Is in the middle of this uproar, this kind of social thunder running in parallel to the efforts to protect and understand the phenomena that book about monuments was conceived. We thought that some of these chapters and the merit to be re registered as a real time memory, we thought also that we needed to force perspective of something that was pure immanence, including voices from other dis disciplines approaches and context to enrich and open the debate, helping us to walk out from our own interpretative frames. The book edited by the Catholic University Edition and the Center of Cultural Heritage of the same university with the National Council of Monuments of Chile is in this sense, a chronicle of a moment and a specific context. But at the same time, a wider reflection about art, heritage, social changes, public space and cultural goods with the aim to go beyond the inner limitations of the specific case. In some of this was achieved is thanks to the merits of artists, scholars, thinkers and professionals that accepted our invitation and whose lucid lectures helped us to understand and give sense to all these events. In addition, to the authors of today's panel, this publication includes texts of Fernando Perez, director of National Mon Mon uh, Museum of Arts and the current National Prize of Architecture, Olaya San Fuentes, a scholar and chair of the Conference uh, of the Association of Critical Heritage Studies that will take place in Santiago some days uh, before today, during the last week, and works of Paula Quintero, Pilar Quinteros and Andres Duran, notable and young Chilean artists that enrich the debate with very pertinent contributions. A part of them, it's especially significant that the rest of the authors of this project are here today with the happy and unexpected coincidence that three of them live here in New York. Having them here gathered with Luis, I don't think it's necessary for me to summarize the scope of their contributions to this humble book and to their disciplinary field of knowledge in a wider manner. 
I just want to say that all of the authors that are here today have a provocative and a long-term reflection about monuments, history, communities, art, preservation, material, memory, legislation, and the political scope of these charged concepts. Because of all of the above mentioned, I want to give the floor to them and start this conversation on public monuments. And thank you very much. Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you so much for coming and, and thank, uh, thank you all who put this program together. I'm really honored to, to be here. Um, I'm here as something, uh, as something of an outlier, uh, as a historian of urban civic art and the built environment, but primarily in New York City. Uh, and from, but ranging from the late 19th century into the present day. Uh, some of the case studies I've explored over time were intended to be celebrations. So I have a few examples here like on the left. Um, others commemorative and elegiac, Fireman's Memorial on the right. Various more recent ones involved overt social critique, phenomenological explorations or self-reflexivity uh, and more. My research on contemporary public art has focused primarily on that which was either municipally sponsored or facilitated through public-private partnerships between the city and nonprofits. Uh, and so these would be examples of those. I say all this to point out that I'm no expert on contemporary art and social protest in Chile. I come to these discussions as one who's taken issue with some of the effects of social protest upon the older monuments populating urban landscapes, be it in Santiago, Valparaiso, uh, Chicago, or New York City namely their denunciation and in some cases removal. I understand completely uh, the reasons for such actions, uh, but believe they are misguided. Um, and um, which is not to say that I disagree with what has been done, uh, for example, in Santiago with Abacadano since that time. So I, I'm not coming at this from, um, uh, let's say a, a, a conservative Republican perspective. Uh, my perspective is my own. And my reasons are grounded in the kind of detailed analyses I've undertaken for the last 30 odd years. Removals of old, older monuments have been premised on the single-minded idea that monuments are celebrations of their subjects and remain so and that their continued presence validates those subjects. I regard monuments as culminations or embodiments of, or, or, or processes involving a range of individual actions, actors, organizations, groups, uh, with differing motivations and entailing different conditions and circumstances and stories that are as much about uh, municipal history and different people as anything else. Sorry, uh, let's see, let me go back. No, okay, let me go forward. So take Virginio's, uh, Virginio Arias' monument to Manuel Bacalano, for example, in Santiago's uh, Plaza Italia, or that's what it was called. I don't know what it's called that now. This work has been vilified and removed, and you'll learn much more about all that, and you already have. Um, and the removal, as I understand it, was is ostensibly temporarily, but that doesn't appear to be the case any longer. Um, and it, it's been removed for Bacadano's role in uh, suppressing the rebellion of the indigenous uh, Mapuche chiefs and occupation of Ara Araucania. But a full exploration of the monument's conception and development within the context of 
urban and national politics and focusing on specific individuals circa 1928, for example, can offer important nuanced insights into the workings of the municipality uh, and the activities and power players of Santiago and the Chilean nation. Similarly, detailed investigations of the three uh, Columbus monuments in Chicago and the two out of five in New York City reveal that the circumstances underlying the genesis of each of them, uh, beyond the obvious desire to celebrate Columbus as harbinger of civilization versus uh, barbarism, symbol of religious triumph and manifest destiny, and assertion of Italian-American uh, pride and pre presence, presence in the face of prejudice, all of these um, uh, monuments were completely different. In some cases, monuments shed light on family dynamics and estate politics, the Samuel Tilden Monument on uh, Riverside Drive, um, the, the Lafayette Monument in Brooklyn. Uh, these these uh, circumstances can be nuanced, very human, and more insightful than the sweeping and sometimes superficial claims about the venality of the hero depicted. Examination of works like the Bacchidano or Columbus monuments in Valparaiso or New York City or Chicago or anywhere else from perspectives that don't take racial, class, or gender injustices as the sole point of departure for investigation or judgment can offer alternative complementary findings that enhance our understanding of the urban built environment and urban history and the evolution of cities more broadly. They enable us to appreciate these works in ways that are constructive and life enhancing. Thank you. Hello. Muy buenas tardes. Eh, mi nombre es Luis Montes Rojas. Y lo primero que voy a hacer es disculparme, porque hoy eh, Emilio gentilmente me va a ayudar a traducir esta ponencia. Yes, um, his, Luis, Luis Montes Rojas. Um, Jorge Otero Pagos was supposed to translate uh, Luis, huh? so it's very funny. I'm not the best, best translator, but we will try. Ok. Bueno, muchas gracias eh, al, a la universidad eh, por la invitación, eh, al decano, a Jorge Otero, y al equipo que ha permitido eh, este evento. <coughs> Thank you very much to Jorge, to the Dean, Andres, and all the staff that is making possible this event. Cuando me toca hablar de este tema, posiblemente se me producen muchos problemas, porque mi papel no es único. When I was asked to talk about this, this topic, um, I felt very troubled because my paper, the paper of Luis in this kind of discussion is not unique. Eh, soy escultor, eh, soy académico de universidad e investigador, eh, y al mismo tiempo eh, oficio de restaurador, y por lo tanto me toca estar en muchos papeles respecto de eh, la eh, actuación sobre un monumento. ¿no? Luis is a sculptor and, and a scholar, a researcher and a restorer of monuments, so um, he's capable to see the phenomena in a very diverse way. Eh, y por lo tanto, ya que el evento dice relación respecto del patrimonio y el arte contemporáneo, voy a partir por el arte contemporáneo. I will start by the contemporary art because this event is uh, trying to talk about monuments and its relation to, to the art. Mi trabajo relaciona eh, la escultura con eh, 
la, un, digámoslo así, una vinculación histórica, entendiendo que esta disciplina tiene un vínculo eh, indisoluble con la noción de monumento. Mm, his work uh, relates sculpture and history because he, he thinks that um, these two topics are merged in, in a very uh, intrinsic way. Esta, esta obra que tenemos atrás eh, parece un coro eh, de mujeres gritando y da la casualidad que en una restauración eh, producida por un gran un, el, el daño de una escultura producida por un gran terremoto en Chile en el año 2010 permitió visualizar el rostro de la escultura que estaba en un pedestal eh, a 10 metros de altura. This is a work of, of Luis that was exposed at the National uh, Museum of Art that was located in, in, a, in the city, in, a, in, a, in an upper location, and the um, earthquake of 2010 um, allows us to see this face in, in a very closer way. En la investigación de este monumento, descubrimos que su origen eh, no estaba en Chile, sino en Perú. In the research to restore the monument, they discovered that the origin of this monument was in Perú and not in Chile. El ejército chileno lo toma de una bodega y lo lleva hacia la ciudad de Talca. Um, militars of Chile take the monument and, and put it in Talca, in Chile. Eh, para nuestra sorpresa, eh, el monumento no había sido destituido. El monumento original seguía en, en Perú. The original monument um, was still in Perú. Por lo tanto, lo que teníamos que saber era por qué eh, eh, un monumento había sido desechado, por qué esta escultura no estaba puesta sobre el pedestal. So we we needed to know why this sculpture was um, in this place and not in its in the original place that it was think to to be in the public space. Finalmente, eh, la gran diferencia entre la escultura que queda en Perú y la que se va a Chile era el rostro de la mujer. Finally, the mainly difference between the original sculpture and the one that that was in Chile was the face of the woman. Y ese rostro fue el que eh, tomamos, eh, tomé como referencia para producir esta instalación en el museo. This face was taken by Luis to make this installation in the exhibition, in the museum. Eh, el gran muro era repletado por las máscaras tomadas del monumento eh, que se ubica ahora en Chile. And the main wall of the, of the museum was uh, full with, uh, with the face of this woman. Lo, import lo importante para mí es pensar que Históricamente, la mujer nunca había sido considerada sujeto de la historia, sino objeto para la historia. One thing that was uh, important for Luis was that the woman was not considered the subject of history, but the object of history. Eh, la, 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 la utilización de la imagen de la mujer servía para poner eh, materialmente eh, en escultura, a través de la escultura, eh, la eh, referencia a la libertad, a las bellas artes, a la justicia, y en este caso, a la victoria. The presence of woman was a tool to express another kind of values like liberty, victory, or among others. Por lo tanto, este eh, se empieza a, a configurar como una especie de antimonumento. So for him, this is something like an anti-monument. Porque creo que habla eh, justamente de la, del rechazo de una escultura por un gesto eh, extremadamente eh, violento que no se le permitía a la mujer. 
he believes this work uh, talks about the rejection of an expression that what was not allowed for a woman. Esta obra entonces se llama Hysterie. El nombre es eh, tomado obviamente del francés y esa referencia a la histeria como la enfermedad mental eh, atribuida a las mujeres en una, eh, digámoslo así, eh, muy compleja eh, relación. The name of the work is Hysterie, um, in reference to the mental disease of the uh, hysterical woman. Obviamente, para mí es, un, eh, es un, una muestra de la complejidad del tema respecto de los monumentos y especialmente de la mirada contemporánea sobre aquellos valores que se materializan en la escultura. For him, this work is a way to show the complexity of monuments and the way they are um, appearing in public space. Gracias. En general, eh, la iconoclasia eh, tiene que ver con la escultura, eh, no necesariamente con la pintura. Mientras los monumentos caen en la, en la ciudad, las pinturas siguen cómodamente colgadas en los en museos. Mm, iconoclasm is about sculpture more than a painting. While sculptures uh, are falling down, uh, paintings are still... Uh, Comfortable. Comfortable in the museums, yes. Gracias. Eh, <ríe> la, la escultura propone una relación particular, porque hay una diferencia brutal entre una pintura y una escultura. La escultura propone un cuerpo. Sculpture is proposing a, a body, a volume. This is the main uh, difference with painting. El cuerpo reemplaza al héroe y por lo tanto el, lo que tenemos ahí eh, no es necesariamente un objeto, no es solo un objeto. And the body replaces the hero, so we are not having just an object. There's there is the hero <coughs> in the body of the hero there. Y aquí tomamos una idea eh, que propone eh, Jorge Otero Pailos cuando va a Santiago de Chile el 2020 y que fue eh, la idea del patrimonio en diálogo. ¿no? And we took the idea of Jorge Otero Pailos when he was in Chile about the heritage in, in dialogue. Y por, y, ¿Y por qué digo esto? Porque fuimos invitados ante el Consejo de Monumentos Nacionales, que es el órgano que definía si el monumento abaquedano se quedaba o debía ser retirado, y propusimos que no fuera retirado, que el monumento siguiera ahí. Um, because we were invited to the National Council of Monuments to defend the permanence of this monument in its uh, location. A mí me parecía que Baquedano eh, funcionaba incluso casi como el primer manifestante, ¿no? La, 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 la gran eh, comunidad que se manifestaba en ese lugar eh, lo trasvestía, lo disfrazaba y lo hacía parte de la manifestación. Um, Baquedano was in this sense the first manifestant, was part of the protest and was uh, transformed by the protesters. Y los daños que estaba recibiendo la escultura no eran de carácter permanente. O sea, la, eh, el monumento podía seguir estando ahí. The damages um, of Paquedano were not permanent, um, so the monument uh, could be still in its place. Lo que ocurre en Chile no necesariamente es igual a lo que ha ocurrido ni en Estados Unidos, ni en España, ni en Argentina, eh, ni en Bélgica. What happens in, in Chile is different uh, from what we have seen in other contexts like Spain, Belgium, and among others. ¿Y por qué digo esto? Porque no solo las esculturas o los monumentos con carácter militar o de conquistadores fueron atacados. 
And this because not, not just the military monuments or conquered monuments were attacked. Eh, en esta fotografía ven el busto de José Martí, poeta e inspirador de la eh, Revolución Cubana, que estaba cer ubicado cerca del monumento de Baquedano y e igualmente eh, fue eh, grafiteado. ¿no? Um, here is José Martí, um, inspiration of Cuban um, revolution that was also attacked during the manifestations. Entonces, eh, lo que pasa en Chile más bien tiene que ver con una, eh, digámoslo así, una ola de manifestación contra eh, la noción de autoridad, eh, digámoslo así, materializada en el monumento. ¿no? What happens in Chile is a wave uh, against the, the idea of authority that the monument reflects. En todo, en todo monumento. In every monument. Yes. Ahí está. No, perdón, eso fue, it's my mistake. <coughs> Por lo tanto, eh, el izamiento de Baquedano, la sacar a Baquedano de ese lugar, no puede ser pensado como un eh, acto iconoclasta. So the retirement of Paquedano is, is not an act of iconoclasm. Sino más bien una acción del Estado donde ejerce el derecho a preservar su propia historia. But an action in which the state is um, trying to preserve its own history. Por lo tanto, la acción de restauración, y aquí eh, en Garza... Eh, vincula con lo presentado por Emilio en su, en su ponencia, tampoco eh, vino a borrar toda la historia que estaba sobre el monumento. So the restoration action was not an effort to erase the history accumulated uh, over the monument. En cinco sectores de la superficie del monumento fueron eh, resguardadas áreas de conservación donde hoy todavía puedes eh, ver la pintura eh, que fue eh, acumulada durante las manifestaciones. In five songs of the monument, uh, we preserve um, the painting that was accumulated over uh, during the manifestations. Por eso me parece que el trabajo sobre este tipo de, de, de situaciones eh, son extremadamente complejas. Eh, porque consideran eh, la noción de patrimonio, eh, la relación con la historia, la relación con la política, la identidad y un punto que me gustaría nunca perder, la relación eh, con, eh, eh, con de estos objetos con eh, el propio arte y la noción de autor. So the work over this kind of pieces is very complex because you have to deal with the idea of patrimony, of heritage, of patrimony, history, politics, identity, art, um, among others, I, I, I will say. Finalmente, eh, hoy estamos a la espera de la decisión del gobierno respecto de qué sucederá con el monumento de Baquedano. Finally, we're waiting for the final decision about the destiny of the of Baquedano, um, where it, it, the, the peace will be uh, finally. Hoy espera en el patio del Museo Histórico Militar la definición de su localización. Today the monument uh, waits in the courtyard of the Museum of um, Military History, mm -hmm. um, its final location. En el intertanto, el arte contemporáneo debe seguir pensando este tipo de cuestiones. Um, in between, um, contemporary art will still be thinking about this kind of, of questions. Esta obra se llama Ornamento eh, y lo que hace es eh, 
modelar en pequeñas estatuillas eh, a los militares que eh, sufrieron mutilaciones en la guerra del Pacífico a finales del siglo XIX, entre eh, guerra entre Chile, Perú y Bolivia. And this work is named uh, Ornament and show the models of taken by, the, by these pictures of uh, mutilated uh, soldiers during the Pacific War in, at the end of the 19th century. Estas fotografías son fotografías de archivo, son fotografías que eh, se ocupaban para poder eh, pagarle eh, la, eh, el, el subsidio del Estado eh, por eh, el cuerpo dañado, por el, por el miembro perdido. These photographs are from a public archive. Y a, y a partir de estas, eh, modelé las pequeñas esculturas que eh, tienen el tamaño preciso para poder estar dentro de las casas. These photos um, were the origin of the, this work of Luis. And, yeah. and, and its size, perdona, um, um, it's, um, It's the same as a um, home sculpture. Lo que me interesaba era que ya que, las, ya, que los, ya que los cuerpos mutilados no pueden estar en el espacio público, entonces eh, podían ser ornamento en el interior de una casa. He was interested in the capacity of these mutilated bodies to be an ornament inside a house. Y casi en una operación militar, eh, los camuflamos y los metimos en la casa de un, eh, este era un, ¿cómo se llama? De un, de un, los que venden, de un anticuario, perdón. Eh, as a military strategy, they put it in the house of a collector of antiquities. Y la verdad es que las esculturas pasaron a ser parte del paisaje. So now the sculptures are part of this uh, domestic landscape. Si no pudimos rendirle honor en el espacio público, entonces el problema sigue estando ahí y por lo tanto la escultura y el arte contemporáneo siguen eh, pensándolo continuamente. Si no pudimos dar honor en el espacio público, tienen esta posición y esta manera de pensar sobre ellos a través del arte art. Muchas gracias. Árbol de vida. Tree of life. I think I did that work maybe 81, 82. And um, I decided to bring up this image because when Luis Emilio invited me to write for this book, I thought uh, it must be a mistake. Why should I have to write about monuments when my life has consisted in gathering basuritas, little debris, and making these words, words, I said, no, works, that if you uh, breathe too strongly next to them, they fall apart. And as you can see, this work has lots of repairs because it really breaks uh, by itself. Nevertheless, it has survived. And so has this one. Um, if you are students of architecture, you know that these little palitos, these little sticks that you use to make the models, are usually thrown out when they're broken. Those are the kinds of things that I pick up. And I weave them together with sewing thread. If you have ever handled sewing thread, you know that it also falls apart by itself. And I was trying to find images for you and I don't have a lot of patience with the computer and suddenly this image popped up. So I put it in here. But what I was so struck by the wonderment of Luis Montes, 
having uh, brought up this, and also Luis Emilio, the image of Baquedano being lifted up by a thread. I thought, what a fantastic um, way in which when a group of speakers are gathered together, often I see that something connects our minds because we're thinking of a common place where we're going to be seeing each other and talking each other. So something that is not us picks the images. And this is what happened with this work. This is a little stone. The actual piece is about this big. And it is a mica stone that existed in the Northeast of the US. As you know, there's a lot of mica in this part of the world. And to me, those are endlessly fascinating because they shine like a night star, like a night sky. And um, also this piece couldn't be more fragile. And so uh, in order to, to speak a little about what is it that I wrote for Mr. Emilio, because uh, I tried to dissuade him from having me write about this because um, I really didn't think I would have anything to say about it. And somehow, um, I don't know what you did, Luis Emilio, but here I am. <coughs> and so <coughs> I'm not going to really read you what I wrote, but I'm just going to hover over it. <coughs> so uh, I thought, um, I asked him actually, why me and the monument uh, when most people would think of me as the living anti-monument because of my basuritas and my focus on everything that disappears, dissolves, and is never heard of again. And um, he said precisely because of that. So that opened me to think of what is it that one could think about the document. The document, look what I said, document instead of monument. Because in truth, the monument is the document and likewise. So I came to think of the word monument itself. And if I remember correctly, I started to uh, focus on that particular word. So it says, <clears throat> the word monument is the witness to a relationship. It comes from the Latin monumentum, from monere, to counsel, warn, admonish, like in Spanish, admonestar, warn. The question is of what it wishes to warn us. Of course, I'm aware that nobody thinks of the monument as a warning today. But in the ancient past, it may have meant that. Of course, when we deal with etymology, we are dealing with the imagination or the hypothesis of what a meaning could have been, why the word was constructed like a little monument itself, a linguistic monument. How come it has survived more than 2,000 years? And the meaning keeps changing. <clears throat> if you look at the dictionaries, they could say something like this. A structure erected as a memorial, venerated for a certain reason, an admirable achievement. From the Latin, monere, moneo, to warn, make known, advise, recall, and even earlier, proto-Indo-European, men to think the linguistic zero of the Greek menos, a spirit and mentor, stai to recall, mnemosine, goddess of memory. <clears throat> Mother of the nine muses and of its contrary, amnesia and other variants, monitor, monster, premonition. To predict, augur, Prophecy, says Virgil, horrenda monere, la horripilante, la espantosa, el horror, lo que no queremos saber. That, of course, may be the energy behind the attack. 
of the monuments because practically in every revolution or change of system, just as Luis was saying so beautifully that the monumento is actually a body. So people either attack it or they make it one of their own. I love that idea that Baquedano was manifesting, of course. And um, when I was studying this issue, I encountered a story from Mesopotamia, perhaps. I am just improvising now a few thousand years ago when an archeologist, I believe he was an American archeologist, digging discovers a monument that had been attacked very much like Baquedano, but very different from Baquedano because the monument had had its eyes extracted and removed, its tongue removed so that the monument would not see anymore and therefore could not be respected, regarded as important because its vision could not be valid anymore. So another aspect of this meditation was to make me think of the fact that uh, this change of a scale, and it's very interesting that you did the same thing, Luis. In pre-Columbian America, there was a, a concept of a scale that is very particular of Amerindian America, which is that, for example, you find these all the way from North America to the deep South America, which is that sometimes a little sculpture of a temple or a little textile would be done this big, maybe an inch tall. And then the same piece would be expanded to be very, very large. And this I associate to a way of seeing the landscape that is also characteristic of Latin America, of ancient America, which is, uh, and you see it, uh, for example, in the Southwest, in the US, you see it in Mexico and in the Andes, in Nazca. And also the Kipu is one of these ideas where the people would see their bodies and their city, their town uh, in a sort of a scale that is a cosmic scale where they could design these straight roads that connected not just to a place thousands of miles away, but also to the stars and the constellations where water is born, for example. So I began thinking, why is it that this concept of the scale is not applied anymore to the scale of imagination? And I reversed the thought to think that the word monument has become also the notion of what is monumental. So in my meditation, I was thinking, what is monumental about our time beyond the social protest, which is universal now all over the planet? Because what is monumental is our destructiveness. What is monumental now is the notion that we are destroying our home and yet we don't want to think about it. So what kind of monumentality is our indifference, our insensitivity, our loss of humanness, our loss of humanity? Isn't that what is really monumental? And so the destruction which as you have demonstrated was a soft, soft destruction because it wasn't really a destruction, was more a performance than, um, I love the idea that the, in Chile, that for example, people could not distinguish Martí, they probably didn't even know that Martí was a poet that fought for the liberation of Cuba and that actually died in the defense of the independence of Cuba. And so it doesn't matter where people knew or not knew, because I think your point is true, that it is the authority that is being attacked. But why is the authority being attacked? Because the authorship 
it's been forgotten, and this is my personal view, that uh, two people in this room know that the word author comes from an ancient Latin expression. It's auctor. And it is the birth of that is coming from the observation of the flight of birds. And so the word augmentar, augment, augment comes from that uh, same vision. And so that's the word augurio. So what has been forgotten is a way of observing the real, observing what is around us. And the author is really the one that enhances, deepens what is being seen for others to see and appreciate. So the authorship of the monuments is what is really being questioned. Not just the authority, but what is even behind the authority or the word authoritarian is the fact that we now, I believe, and this is the for me, the energy of the social protest around the world is that people wish to reclaim the empowerment of being authors themselves of their own rights and their own thoughts. And that is where I leave my talk in the question of what is it that is being attacked and what is going to be remembered. Yes. yes. Thank you all. Um, it's I'm I'm really gutted not to be there. I'm very sorry I can't be there. Uh, I want to start by thanking Dean Jaque for his um, support of this um, of, of of this event, for stepping in, and and for his longtime uh, support of of preservation. I also want to thank my co-panelists and of course Sarah Grace for putting all of this um, together. I want to share with you an experience um, of how I've used art as a method not only to preserve monuments, but also to expand their meanings. But of course, this is not just a, a one-way street. Uh, my art's contact with monuments has also entangled it in unexpected social processes, uh, changing it fundamentally. And rather than resist these social processes, I've chosen to embrace them as part of my artworks and to allow them to push my own ideas about what art and preservation can be. So here we are. This is Westminster Hall uh, in London, in the Houses of Parliament. Six years of work leading up to this moment where we cleaned the wall on the right in collaboration with parliamentary estates as part of an Art Angel Public Art Commission that uh, used latex to lift all of the dust on the on the wall on the right and present it uh, just four meters away from the wall uh, as a large public artwork. It was uh, meant to be a very slow summer. It was the public art piece for the summer so people could come into Westminster Hall, which had been closed to the public. It was originally a public space, but this was a way of reopening it back up to, to the public. Now, little did we know that um, that date, June 23rd, was also the date of the Brexit vote. And it was a, not really on anyone's radar. Um, you know, it was supposed to be a non-event, but of course it was a world-changing event. And the next day, police presence began to um, be beefed up. This is the entrance to Westminster Hall. Uh, journalists began to arrive. You can see in the background over here the artwork um, hanging in Westminster Hall. And as we were putting the final touches on the piece, journalists began to gather around, um, around the work, waiting for the politicians to arrive, because this is the entrance where all the politicians have to come in. This is the entrance to Parliament. It's the entrance to the House of Lords and the House of Commons. And these journalists were there to make sense of these very recent events. And they were trying to make sense of the immediate, the, the, the now, and in the background of all of that was this piece, this piece, uh, The Ethics of Dust, which was showing thousand years of dust. And as these journalists began to write about the, the events, 
uh, they they actually began to talk about the artwork and to put the events of Brexit into historical perspective. In a way, by lifting the dust off of the walls, they they began to look at the building that uh, they had taken for granted for so long, and then began to question, you know, what is this place? And began to write into their articles uh, about politics, thoughts about the 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 place in which they were at. Now, it had been a very uh, tumultuous lead up to this vote. Uh, here you have the ethics of dust on the right. And on the left uh, was a temporary memorial to Joe Cox, who was a um, politician, a member of parliament who was um, killed by a right wing extremist um, who disagreed with her uh, position to that the United Kingdom should remain in the European Union. So in the following days, as we walk down to Westminster Hall, and here you have Big Ben, which is attached to Westminster Hall, um, just thousands of people began to gather on the way down to Westminster Hall. And this is the kind of scene that we would witness uh, as people walk down to the Westminster Hall. Here they are in front of the Penn Downing Street. Penn Downing Street is in the middle of here. The campaign which they start to play chant. Here they're trying to paint a new chain on the um, So this is when you finally arrive to Westminster Hall. Westminster Hall is over here. Um, they um uh this is this is all the people that that you know would would gather around and then you know you couldn't really get into Westminster Hall because there was police presence there are all these different journalists gathering around Westminster Hall but actually you know our piece was meant to let the public into Westminster Hall so people were able to get a free ticket to go see the artwork. And in fact, people started wising up and they started getting these free tickets to go see the artwork, in fact, to be able to get into Westminster Hall and confront politicians uh, inside. And this was the experience that was in the back of my mind as I traveled to Chile and started to think about what was going on in Chile and, and think about the, the, the way that monuments are these these really these shared objects that are part of social processes uh, and that through contemporary art, when we begin to intervene in these monuments, we're also beginning to intervene in these social processes. Now, Westminster Hall, which you can see here on this is this door on the right is Westminster Hall. It's this door over here, thousand year old building that burnt down and uh, around it, all the buildings around it burned down in 1834. But Westminster Hall, people poured out from London to try to preserve it because it was seen as such an important place. And it was important because really significant political events happened there, like the trial of Charles I in 1649, which was the first time that a ruler had been tried and convicted by parliament. Charles I tried to proclaim himself dictator dictator, essentially, and to um, revoke the Magna Carta and suspend Parliament and become an absolute monarch like Louis XIV. But Parliament seized them and judged them uh, in the in, inside Westminster Hall and condemned them to death. And so that was the first time that a ruler was held to be accountable to the law, just like everybody else. And now in our modern democracies, we have um, this enacted every four years. We take our, our presidents and, you know, we move them out and have a new president uh, in. Now, what I was very interested in is this the materiality of Westminster Hall. And I was very interested in thinking of the materiality as extending not only to the social world, but also to the environmental world. And to think of the dust in Westminster Hall as a, an architectural material. And so here you have a view from 1952, the Great Smog of London, which was deposited on the walls of Westminster Hall, all this, all of this dust. This was the first time that a correlation was made between environmental pollution and mortality rates. Uh, they were very they were able to closely uh, map them. 
But it was also the year in which King George VI uh, died. And of course, here he is lying in state. And on the left, you can see the stained wall. And all those stains on the left over here are the stains that we were able to lift off and made into that work, The Ethics of Dust. Now, the more recent um, funeral procession, you can see that the wall is all cleaned. Never mind these little stages for journalists. These, these were made to look like stone, but they're actually um, plywood. But you can see the difference in the clean over there. And this is this is that that dust that was lifted off of the wall. Now, for me, what was important is to show this dust as part of the history of the place was to also show a collective history, to show um, what we make together as part of how we shape the environment and shape the world. This partly, you know, having to do with what Cecilia just mentioned, of course, that our, our relationship to the world is highly, uh, you know, problematic. But I wanted to include it here because what we have um, in the space is really just a history of uh, of the great people, the great events that happened there in these plaques. And so I wanted to include this larger um, this larger history right next to it and to bring light, quite literally bring light into to that history um, uh, by casting light onto the screen. Now because of all that happened there, because this was the background to the um, to this to this social protest, uh, there was a lot of interest in this piece from uh, uh, different museums. And so a conversation started about, well, really, what should be the destination of this piece, of this dust that comes out of Westminster Hall, but where should it go? And so after a lot of discussion, the decision was made that it shouldn't go to just one place. And so we decided uh, together um, to cut it into uh, seven pieces and um, they were sent to national museums in Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, England, City of London. So all of the nations of the United Kingdom. And this idea of distributing the monument, um, distributing the fragment of the monument was to me a really um, thing new. I, I, you know, I, I had always thought that if you cut up a monument, if you cut up a, a historic monument, if you take fragments from them, if you cut up an artwork, you're basically destroying it. But here, by cutting the work and distributing it to different monuments, it actually to different um, museums, it actually acquired meaning and helped to expand the meaning and the sets of social relations that this building could have. And so here you have a piece of the uh, of the work, and you can see how this piece, this part, correlates to that part. And this is how it was uh, that piece was shown at the Whitworth Museum in Manchester when they had this whole exhibition on politics and parliamentary democracy um, a couple of years after the Brexit vote when this was still going on. So now these fragments are able to enter into a longer dialogue in different places and carry out this social process this um, uh, in relationship to the original building. So. Uh, for me, this was really important to think about uh, a different way to describe these monuments. And so I began to think about the notion of distributed monuments and to think about the way in which a fragment of a monument can, can move and be distributed and still be connected to the original monument and still be able to both expand its meaning and enmesh it in new and contemporary dialogues and social processes about the future. So I'll stop there and I thank you very much. My apologies for not being able to join you in person. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, I would like soon to open it uh, to the audience. So those that have questions, please start raising your hands and I'll be paying attention. But before maybe I, I, I'd like to, to do a couple of uh, questions uh, to all of you. Thank you for your uh, brilliant and, and really timely and necessary uh, interventions. Uh, and the first, I, I'd like to, to uh, acknowledge two important things that have been crossing the different presentations today. The first uh, has to do with, the, with what the monument is and what a monument does, right? And the, what is the notion of monument that, that we can think of now? And what is the one that 
it's useful uh, to understand uh, the complexities that happened in Chile uh, in, 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 in recent times and very specifically uh, in the case of the Bacadano Square and the document and, and monument. And I, I think that there's uh, something that that uh, it's been through the different presentations that the monument if ever was seen as permanent and, uh, and a, a kind of device that provides hegemony, that's not the case here. It's not something that is useful for, for us to understand what happens here. But I, I've been hearing that the, mon that the monument is something that is multiple and stable, uh, distributed, that could be found out of the basuritas and that it's really there where, where we can see the monument as collectively produced as something that is politically useful and that is becomes really a space of dispute. I think this is something that is being crossing the different uh, presentations, and I know, for instance, Michelle talks of the multidimensionality of the of the monument. That I think we 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 should somehow focus on, and maybe it's uh, something that we can dis discuss. And the second, I think, is Bacadano. I think it's uh, floating here as something that it's uh, uh, it's been also very much present in the presentations. And I, when I when we see this, Cecilia was uh, also referring to the fragility of this uh, thing hanging, right? And, and floating and, and sort of this thing, this heavy thing of bronze is meant to be there forever. And it's, we've heard that uh, it was losing its legs and that it was basically, we see it fragile and the uh, basurita has become much more stable and sort of consensual that this, 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 uh, but there were three, we've seen Bacadano's monument in three different ways. Um, uh, one is the it's the Bacadano as removed the pedestal without the Bacadano. The other is the Bacadano painted and with, pe with people on top of it and and all this multiple and collective effort to 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 dispute what it means. And then we see the Bacadano multiplied in these layers and ripped off and distributed, like Jorge would say. I wonder what is that that we can discuss about these different versions, this multiplicity or, or sort of coexistence of many different versions. And, and I think that all of you refer to this uh, way of uh, this multiplicity or this multi scala and, and I, I love the, the reference to scale that Cecilia uh, did. But in different capacities, all of you refer to this uh, tension uh, and this way of challenging the unicity and the authority of the monument by multiplying it and acknowledging its uh, collective dimension. And each of you were referring to that in different um, capacities. Uh, Luis, as an in your different hats, uh, as contemporary artists, uh, as a uh, uh, person that is engaged on preservation, also something that is uh, uh, institutionally engaged with that. Uh, Emilio, in his capacity also as, uh, I would say, public server and, and also intellectual thinking of that, Cecilia, in, in your amazing trajectory, uh, challenging and, 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 and confronting monumentality and authority. Uh, Michelle, as an intellectual and, and scholar reflecting on, on monuments, is also your engagement in the city of New York with it. And Jorge, in the development of this notion of experimental preservation and distributed monuments that you brilliantly presented today. So I propose these two kind of poles or nodes uh, to start the conversation that I think that uh, both of them are these two nodes uh, somehow have your interventions have gravitated uh, uh, around them. Maybe we can start. Yeah. <laughs> a ver, eh, el inicio de la pregunta eh, dice relación con qué es el monumento. Eh, yeah, the, the beginning of the question, uh, uh, it starts with the question, what is the monument, right? El monumento es una gramática. Es una forma de escribir en el espacio público. Monuments are, or oh, the monument is a grammar. It's a way to write uh, on public space. Y la gramática es clara y categórica. El monumento está para permanecer. Uh, and the grammar, it's clear uh, and categoric. The monument is there to stay, to, per, to become permanent. 
La permanencia es el objetivo del monumento y por lo tanto los materiales que son utilizados para esta gramática son materiales que permanecen, que tienen durabilidad en el espacio público. Uh, the main goal of monuments is to become permanent and therefore the materials used to build money or for monuments are those that can become permanent. Por lo tanto, lo que tenemos aquí es primero desde el monumento una pretensión que es eh, la estabilidad. Uh, so what we find here uh, in the first place is an intention, an intention for uh, to to perpetuate to per to perpetuate something. Sin embargo, la tensión tiene que ver con la posibilidad que esto no sea permanente y esa eh, no permanencia tiene dos vías. La primera, la destitución por parte de la ciudadanía o la segunda, eh, la destitución por parte del Estado. So, uh, but that is confronted, that uh, 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 intention of permanence is uh, approach uh, uh, to be destabilized in two different ways. One is the destitution of permanence by citizenship, and the other is the uh, uh, destitution of citizenship by the uh, state. Y a mí personalmente me parece más interesante la destitución por parte del propio Estado, porque eso implica una reflexión y una conciencia respecto de la propia historia que el Estado ha venido a escribir. But for me, uh, uh, it's more important or more interesting for this discussion uh, the destitution uh, enacted uh, by the state, because it implies a reflection and a conscience of how history is uh, materialized to monuments. Lo que tendríamos ahí entonces es una transformación de carácter social que ya está consolidada y por lo tanto el Estado ha hecho suya. What we find here uh, it's a transformation uh, of social character that is already solidified and that the state is made of its own or it's made its own. Finalmente, y para terminar mi intervención, eh, en un momento en Baquedano, en, en la estatua en la mitad de la plaza, lo que vimos fue un espacio de manifestación. El monumento se transformó en un espacio de manifestación popular y por lo tanto eh, la intención primera nunca fue retirarlo. Eh, en ese sentido, vuelvo a hacer referencia a esa idea de Jorge eh, Otero Pailos, ¿no? la idea del patrimonio en diálogo para permitir la expresión sobre el mismo eh, monumento y por lo tanto el patrimonio. Uh, I, I want to refer to a moment that we saw uh, uh, of the Bacadano sculpture or monument where the monument became a site of public demonstration and what was important then it was not to remove the monument because that could be no retirarlo para que se para que permita la manifestación popular. So that not to remove the monument so that the public demonstration can be allowed. Gracias. Um, I love this phrasing that you are using. Like, um, if we turn it around, uh, so you said, el monumento se convirtió en la manifestación, la manifestación se convirtió en el monumento. So I will translate. So that uh, the monument became the rally, the manifestation of the people, and the other way around. Mm -hmm. So, I think that idea is extraordinary. Why? Because it's actually true. I am sure that's how the people experienced it. Being there in that plaza with a million people feeling yet like you felt that justice is necessary is an extraordinary and forgettable feeling, a monumental feeling. And that reflects the way the word and the concept behaves. It behaves through leaps, through transformations and metamorphosis, 
because the monument being something so called solid, something that is physical, that has a body, as Liz was saying, becomes a monumental thing. And people use it in speech. They say, ah, it's so monumental. Mm -hmm. And they refer to maybe somebody send you a look. And that was monumental for you because you thought this person didn't like you, for example. And it's so beautiful the way that this incredible flexibility exist within this solidity, solidity. So this beautiful paradox is what makes us human. And for me, that is what is monumental. That flexibility and ability to change the meaning. About the, the question, what is the, a monument that Andres was um, making. Um, I remember uh, I want to quote, I hope uh, in a good manner to Michelle that um, allows us to ask about who decides, not just what is the, the, the patrimony or what is a monument, but who decides what is this monument. Um, this translation of the of the question uh, puts us in the conditions about the definition of this monument, uh, its origin, uh, the people, the structures of power, uh, not in a dramatic way, but that are uh, behind the decision about what uh, could be in public space. I remember some years ago, 10 years ago, in the National Council of Monuments, we were discussing about the, you know, the, the disconnection between um, society, communities, and public monuments. You know, mm -hmm. we discussed very much about cities, about uh, neighborhoods, about how to preserve, about in instruments of urban planning, archaeology, and so on relationship of, uh, between archaeology and indigenous peoples and uh, scientifics and so but public monuments were something that seems to be uh, not important for for nobody you know uh, they were there and were in some way um, almost nothing part of the landscape and eight years later we were uh, in this social outbreak in which monuments were in the center of the discussion. This is very uh, important, I think, because monuments, um, they were important again, but in a different way, you know? Uh, I think this is very radical in what we are leaving about monuments. Um, and the other question is about um, this multiplicity, this ambiguity of monuments that you were mentioning. I, I, I agree very much. Um, I'm not very happy in some way about the way the discussion we are having in Chile um, is moving in this thing about monuments because um, monuments are now is a tool to um, fortress some political positions in some way. You know, Baquedano protected in the museum, in the military historical museum is a way to um, fortress my vision about this process, you know, mm -hmm. to affirm order, for example. And in the other hand, you see this, um, mm, the idea of the monument just about, uh, um, just as an element that reflects the structures of power in some way, you know? And, and, and this ambiguity that is between this, this discussion and, and you said about the, uh, how you remove uh, the monument intervened, painted, uh, the multiplied layers and so on, this, this uh, ambiguity that maybe is more fruitful to discuss about what we are living as, as, a, as a social crisis, um, I think we are not um, using monuments as a bridge to discuss these things, but maybe as a as a way to to divide the the, the public discussion. Mm -hmm. I I think that's a wonderful um, 
appreciation, Emilio. And I wish um, people in Chile were to hear this kind of conversation and this kind of expression, because I agree. I mean, I, I am very moved uh, by hearing all of you, Michelle, also, because I'm a New Yorker now. And the way you see the monuments as, as a sort of set of relationships is really fascinating because it's true, you know. And this kind of deep truths that are all around us is what we're dismissing because we're occupied by the machine, by the cell phone, whatever. And this opportunity to think of what a horror we are unleashing on each other and on the world, on the land, is also part of thinking of the monument. Yeah. Because the monument, as you said, did you say that it was a bridge? Un puente. I think that is quite true. And so it's an op missed opportunity not to discuss what is it that this tremendous performativity yeah. took place around the monument? Why did they become uh, monumental? They became monumental in that moment. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, I mean, one thing that uh, uh, it's been uh, uh, very clear is that there is something that is happening to the world now, right? That there's certain intensity in the way uh, structures of power are being challenged around the world. It feels that the fragility of the monuments that were explained here uh, is also expressing the fragility of uh, structures of power and authority that in the past were seen much, much more uh, capable of, of being stabilized. I, I, I think, for instance, the, the, the way Jorge narrated the, the, the 1952 moment as the moment where uh, pollution became, uh, for the first time, you said, connected to mortality rates uh, and was the moment in which basically the dust, the pollution, the particles in the air uh, became visible and they became sort of uh, a matter of monumental, I would say, discussion and enactment. And I wonder what's the way that the, the a number of structures of power that are related to modernity, globalization, uh, uh, planetary exploitation, extraction, segregation, racism, we could go on anthropocentrism, uh, are we see them cracking, failing everywhere? Uh, it's somehow something that we can relate to these other lives and performances around monuments. And maybe Jorge, you want to expand on that because I think that the, the thin layer, the, the way you contextualize the thin layer of dust uh, in Westminster was was very much addressing this. Yeah, thank you. No, it's um, uh, um <clears throat> it's a I think a very insightful way of um. Kind of guiding the 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 discussion to talk about the way in which these are these are these monuments are enabling a kind of relationship between constituents and 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 political political frameworks and political structures that are that are fraught and I I think that this is um, I I want to acknowledge just the the how daring it was for the work that Emilio and Luis and others. <clears throat> did in Chile because there was so much pressure to take down that monument. You know, the military was insistent that it be removed. And uh, and the fact that they resisted and allowed it to remain there for as long as they could really enabled uh, the interaction with the public, those protests to go on and those kinds of interactions to go on. And so back to your original question, Andres, about what can a monument do? You know, <clears throat> it, it allowed for the public um, in, in the way that Cecilia presented it, you know, to become present. I mean, to be, to, to be seen by the state. Uh, and to be, you know, Celia talked about it as monumental, you know, the, 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 the social groups that were manifesting themselves there in relationship to that monument 
uh, we're all of a sudden able to to ask certain kinds of questions of the state to to perform that challenge in a way that they couldn't do verbally, for example. You know that that they had they were able to deploy kind of visual uh, presencing around that monument and to challenge those structures. Um, and, and they would have never been able to articulate that simply verbally, you know, it wouldn't have been as, as powerful. And in that way, uh, that monument and others, I think serve a really important process of, of, um, of nonverbal dialogue between these social structures and political structures, um, and, and to allow for certain kinds of themes to emerge that are not necessarily, um, something that you can capture in words right away they they are more poetic and more um you know pregnant with lots of different meanings and so allowing for those different meanings to to be there and not to foreclose on them too quickly is what emilio and luis were able to do by by leaving them leaving the horse you know per, keeping the horse there as long as possible because if you challenge that that nonverbal process too quickly, then you immediately foreclose on the possibility of something new emerging because you're just going to put on whatever, you know, previous conceptions that you had of power and of social relations and so on. So for, for the, for the new to really emerge, you need a process and that process and the monuments are very much part of that process. Uh, and that social relation. I think it's something that also M Michelle's work really shows is that these are social processes and they take a while. Uh, and so when when they are foreclosed, that's when authority comes down. You know, like when when the authority comes down, it comes down to stop the process because it see, sees itself challenged by the whole thing. It finally recognizes, oh, wait, wait, <laughs> things are changing. Um and that's where I think that subtle moves. I, I'm I'm so amazed by the work that they did with re removing that that layer of paint. That is actually technically really hard to do, but you know the military took that monument into its possession. But the work that Luis and, and Emilio were able to do saved that layer as part of the story. And 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 is now in the National Archives. So that social relation, that visual nonverbal relation can still go on for a little bit longer. And I think it's important in, in light of the in light of the attempts to write a new constitution. Um, these are the images that we keep coming back to. Um, so so and I think that just to you know put it back to Cecilia and, and Michelle. In in both of your works, you you've talked about how objects are are really relations. Um, you know, Cecilia, you've talked about how how artworks are really sets of relations. Um, and and so I wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Uh, how a an ephemeral kind of work like the kipu that you work on and the uh, in these basuritas. You know, how do you see those as enabling different kinds of relations that that let's say a Baquedano wouldn't be able to yeah. to enable? Gracias, Jorge. Um, I don't know if I'm the one called to speak, but I have to say I, I'm very moved by this. I had no idea of the work you had done with El Despellejado. I don't even know how to say that in English but the notion that the skin of the monument was removed so preciously as a way of preserving the memory of the rally, I think that is going to be remembered. That is going to go deeply into the history of Chile and the history of our own memory because it's an act of love for what happened for all of it, all the complexity, contradiction, paradox, all of that is contained in that act of love. Um, that is the true meaning of preservation. I love the concept of the experimental preservation because when we are doing something, an experiment like art is truly an experiment, we have no idea what the actual preservation will be. 
you know, because, uh, for example, um, when you ask me about the precarious, Jorge, I can tell you that when I began doing my basuritas in the Bishop of Concon in the year 1966, was I had been admitted to architecture school and I wanted to create a new kind of architecture. And I wanted for this to be a part of the ocean so that the ocean would acknowledge it and the ocean actually erased it instantly. And for me, that relationship with the ocean was the permanent aspect of the precarious. Because the only thing that is permanent and quantum physics demonstrates this is the relationship. And therefore, a new concept of being human on this earth has to be to restore the ancient ethical content of the quality of the relationship, the way we relate to each other. This is what I have learned from the precarious. From the basuritas have been teaching me. I have very little to do because the basuritas, the debris was actually showing me the way. A basurita is a piece of debris that has, for example, been thrown about in the city of Manhattan. I'm constantly picking up debris from Manhattan streets. They're so beautiful. How did this little piece of wire become a thing of beauty? I put it in a museum, ah, people go out like that. Whether you're stepping on it, it's nothing. But when you put it in a place, so what is the art? The art is the way we direct our gazes, the way we look at our own gazes and what the gaze is speaking, saying to us. So the subtlety of all these relationships is infinite. About the kipu, what have I learned from the kipu? The kipu, somehow, when I began doing the kipu, um, nobody was speaking about kipu. Why did this Chilean teenager found, found, yes, found, I have trouble with my tenses, as you can see. Um, why do I have trouble with the sen senses or the tenses? I have trouble with both. Because the tenses are um, a tension. It's a movement. So when I speak of the moment when I discover the kipu, I feel I am in the presence of that moment as I tell you about it. It's not a moment that occurs in time and space only. It also is, uh, took place in another dimension, a dimension I have access to each time I even think of the kipu or I begin doing a kipu. So what is the teaching? What is the transmission? If you think that the kipu was created 5,000 years ago, and during all this time, thousands of people have been working with the kipu, I'm just one of them. And I participate in this field of infinite knowledge that is condensed in the kipu. I feel the same when I tell you that the word monument, it's really speaking of what the mind is telling to itself. This is what is monumental. We have the gift of awareness. We have this gift of observing. That's why I mentioned the only way to question authority is to become the author of your own thoughts, the author of your own awareness. So this is what this meditation that Luis Emilio invited me has given me. And hearing all of you really moves me very deeply. Michelle, do you want to? Um, I can't really build on that. Um, I, I guess all I would say is that um, that everything that everyone is saying is true. Uh, and that there is ephemerality to monuments, there um, is a certain uh, disembodiment to the way we think about monuments now, but that to my mind, there is something big missing in the discourse about monuments that has suddenly, you know, that erupted in the past five years. 
uh, whereas, uh, as Emilio said, nobody paid it, you know, nobody paid any, any attention to monuments before, uh, which is, you know, um, where I tried to do my work was to teach people about them um, and why they're interesting, uh, but that the discussions of, of recent years don't include any of that. They are, uh, to my mind, they have been totally focused on the present and our feelings about what we believe we see in them um, and what we see in them are the subjects, as I said before, so I won't elaborate on that. But um, if you read my work, um, if you look into the other histories of these objects um, that are, those histories are complex, they evolve over time, so they're not stable. They reflect power relations, but those power relations are not stable. So everything about the histories of these works combined with their aesthetic dimensions, and I'm not talking about beauty here, I'm talking about the materiality of those objects as they intersect with public space, um, landscape architecture, architecture, all sorts of different things, and people, and people's actions. Um, there are layers upon layers of destabilized meanings um, yeah. that are uh, imbued in those works that no one has a clue about because no one is interested in anything other than this current uh, situation. And I'm being, you know, sweeping here, but uh, I'm just responding uh, succinctly yeah. to your question. Yeah. <laughs> we can open it now to a couple of questions we would like, but do you want to please? Do, do we have a mic? Yeah. And if you have other questions, raise your hands and we'll take a, a couple of them. And then. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, in large part, about by Lisa's uh, education of Hanno uh, and Martin's destruction of the, of, the, of the sculptures, of the monuments, as an attack on authority. Uh, and then also Cecilia's uh, questioning of like, if, is that attack on authority on uh, authorship? Not that whether I should, but is there a space for new monuments? And I'm saying monuments very much like these physical municipality, municipality driven objects. Yeah. Um, and where the role of contemporary art sits, because uh, again, Luis said that maybe as the monument is in storage, the contemporary art keeps the conversation happening should we be worried about maybe the art itself becoming a monument that embodies these same issues of authorship, of authority that we are questioning right now? Thanks. Mi, voy a tratar de explicarlo eh, a partir de mi propia experiencia, porque hay algo que yo no he dicho, pero mi padre es escultor. Eh, aparte de eso, eh, trabajo con él. Eh, somos, uh, sí, perdón. I'll try to explain it with, uh, from my own experience. There's something that I didn't say, that it's that uh, my father is a sculptor, uh, and I work with him. Somos profesores de la universidad y tenemos el taller de restauración y fundición. Uh, we are uh, university professors and we run the uh, workshop of uh, Fondry. Fondry. Eh, y restauración. restauración. And restoration, sorry. Eh, por lo tanto, mi relación con la eh, historia de la escultura es como sentirme en mi propia casa. So my relationship with the history of uh, sculpture is like being at home. Los escultores entonces reivindicamos el derecho a poder trabajar sobre aquello que constituye nuestro eh, marco referencial. Uh, sculptures uh, claim a right to work with that that constitutes our referential frame. Y en ese sentido, eh, incluso había notado esta reflexión aquí. 
eh, me parece que hay una vinculación muy estrecha entre iconoclasia y arte contemporáneo. Uh, along these lines, and I uh, uh, actually wrote it down, there's a direct correlation between eco iconoclas iconoclasia, right? Or iconoclasm? Iconoclasm, Icon iconoclasm and contemporary, contemporary art. Contemporary art. Eh, yo sí, eh, creo que eh, el arte contemporáneo eh, adquiere formas de iconoclasia permanentemente. I believe contemporary art uh, enacts forms of iconoclasm uh, constantly. Y por lo tanto, eh, nos hemos acostumbrado en el arte contemporáneo a, a cristalizar esas imágenes. And we uh, became used uh, in contemporary art to crystallize those images. Eh, siento que, el, perdón, creo que el arte contemporáneo eh, ha eh, naturalizado esa, esa relación estética. Y desde mi perspectiva, la, el interés que tiene esa relación eh, es más bien político. Para mí no es solamente superficial, es de carácter político. Uh, I believe that uh, contemporary art has crystallized that relationship, and for me that relationship is, a, is a of a political nature. Y termino con esto. Eh, esa, eh, esa vinculación con el monumento como lugar de origen eh, es, en mi caso, eh, permanente. Y por lo tanto, me parece que esa, en esa lógica eh, se puede entender que el monumento no puede dejar de ser político, no puede ser considerado solamente un objeto de carácter ornamental, porque, pre, porque perdón, y aquí termino, porque siempre está diciendo, eh, expresando un discurso de carácter político. Uh, that engagement of the monument with uh, its origin, uh, in my case, means that it has a political dimension, and that political dimension cannot be uh, 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 avoided because the monument always expressed that uh, uh, political engagement. Muchas gracias. Había otra pregunta, ¿verdad? Por ahí. Uh, there was another question, right? As you know. And maybe with this question, we can close. Yes. Uh, okay, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, I'm not an artist, so sorry if it is a really basic question, but according to you, why people look so much for monuments? Because during the old Chilean uprising, the most interesting part for me when I was there is that when Baquedano monument was removed, like people constructed their own monument of a dog that was in the street, the, like the cop killer was the name of the dog. But people tried to look for a replacement rather than just destroying it. And when they burned the, this cop killer, they made a new monument made of flowers. So why people keep looking for monuments? Like why people, when my football team wins, like Colo Colo, like people go to celebrate with a monument. Mm -hmm. and. Why people try to gather around it? Why people keep trying to create a new monument, a place to be around it? Yeah. Prefiero la Universidad de Chile, pero bueno. <laughs> it's uh, uh, two teams of soccer. Uh. Well. I, I prefer the uh, University of Chile, right? As a soccer team, right? <laughs> ¿Ustedes verdaderamente creen que la monumentalidad está en peligro? Uh, do you really think that uh, monumentality is being endangered? Eh, como tú bien dices, apenas salió el Baquedano, eh, tendió a ser reemplazado por otros. As soon as Baquedano uh, was uh, removed, there was uh, new, uh, uh, new, new things to come, right? Sí, to new, new moment, monuments, uh, el, el, del, el del perro, o algunos intentos de colocar una mujer. Eh, la discusión ha estado encima de la mesa. ¿Qué reemplaza a Baquedano? Uh, there was a dog or, or a woman. Or a woman. Uh, the discussion has been what uh, is that that will replace Baquedano? Por lo tanto, eh, yo pensaría desde otra perspectiva, ¿por qué los monumentos son importantes? O sea, eh, perdón, nos paseamos hoy por esta ciudad y está llena de monumentos. 
So uh, from a different perspective, I will propose to ask uh, why uh, monuments are needed. Uh, we go, uh, we walk around the city and it's full of monuments. Es más, yo diría que Estados Unidos entendió muy bien el sentido de la gramática monumental. Uh, I'd say that the, the, the U.S. Uh, understood very well uh, the sense of uh, the monumentality, the grammar of monumentality. De mi perspectiva, no es la gramática monumental lo que está en peligro, sino aquello que sostiene. Y por lo tanto, lo que a mí me interesa pensar es cómo se dan esas transformaciones, no solo a nivel social, eh, sino más bien a nivel, eh, de, eh, a nivel transversal, involucrando también decisiones de Estado. For me, what is important is not whether uh, monuments are in danger, but what are the structures uh, uh, behind them, and what is the way that that... Yo estaba pensando no, solo, no solamente social, sino también estatal, o sea, estatal. la transformación del, del, de la conciencia del Estado. Ser, ¿eh? Discutida, so. Sí, yo, a ver, lo repito. No solo la manifestación de carácter social, sino la cristalización de esa discusión en una definición de Estado. Uh, not only uh, the social grammar, but actually the way the state is crystallized uh, uh, as a manifestation uh, mm -hmm. uh, to that discussion, right? Okay. Y con esta pregunta, with this question, we, we can close the, the, uh, the pen. Hi, um, I was struck by your work. Estaba muy sorprendida por tu trabajo, eh, Histeria. Um, especially because that work, uh, the monument you were referring to, uh, was the victory in the Plaza de Mayo in Peru. So that was, eh, la razón por la cual estaba sorprendida era porque esta, este monumento está en la Plaza de Mayo de Peru, se llama La Victoria. Um, so my question is when you were doing this monument that is actually inside, it's a, it's a monument that it's, it's not on an open space. Um, what were your thoughts about um, how to connect it with the, with the monument that is actually in an open space. ¿Cuál era tu, 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 tus pensamientos? O sea, estás poniendo un monumento en un espacio cerrado, pero también estás inspirado en un, un monumento que está en un espacio abierto. Eh, I, wanted, I wanted to know your thoughts about it. Muchas gracias. A ver, eh, la, expo la, la exposición eh, de esa obra eh, se inauguraba el día 25 de octubre del 2019. Uh, the exhibition of that work was on October 25th. Uh, what was the date? 2019. Okay, uh, 2019. El estallido social comienza en Chile el 18 de octubre de 2019. Uh, the uh, social outrage became on uh, the break, uh, uh, break broke uh, on October 18th, uh, uh, 2019. La, la exposición recién se inauguró el 15 de diciembre. Uh, the exhibition was uh, opened on December 15th. Por lo tanto, todo lo que estaba sucediendo afuera en el espacio público, en los monumentos en Santiago, tenía eh, directa relación con lo que estaba aconteciendo dentro de la sala. ¿no? So what was happening outdoors was related to what was happening inside the museum. Y era una frustración tremenda eh, no poder relacionar lo que estaba pasando afuera con lo que estaba ocurriendo dentro de esa exposición. Uh, it was very frustrating not to be able of uh, connecting what was happening outdoors with what was happening in the exhibition inside. Y, y sin, sin ninguna duda, esa, esa obra eh, fue, yo diría, la más eh, eh, impresionante para el público. Especialmente para las mujeres. Yo diría que las mujeres tuvieron una conexión eh, lógica con esa obra. Pero para ser un antimonumento no puede estar en la calle. Para poder ser un antimonumento tenía que estar dentro de la sala. Y es muy es una pieza una obra muy 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 sencilla eh, porque solamente son eh, máscaras de, de yeso eh, de escayola. Yeah, and it's very simple because it's composed of uh, plaster masks. 
reprodu se reproducen las máscaras que son necesarias para eh, llenar el espacio, de tal forma en que esto se transforme en una imagen impresionante. Uh, so the masks were reproduced to fill the, the masks that were needed to fill the space were the ones that were reproduced so that it would become an impressive image. And, and maybe maybe others want to also intervene or the, to this question because I think that it's also connected to. Jorge, maybe you want to close the session with intervention. No, I thank you very much. I I've just um. I'm just in awe of everyone's contributions and and work, and uh, it's been such a pleasure to to hear everyone's work. And just thank you all for for making it all the way from Chile to Colombia and from other parts of the of New York um, to share your knowledge and ideas with us. It's it's really meaningful, and it has repercussions and echoes in a lot of the work that we do here on on monuments so so thank you just deep gratitude <laughs>